If you're starting to get exhausted just listening to me, just remember, this is what it's like inside my head 24-7. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, Neurodivergent, where I make content about being a neurodivergent female diagnosed with autism and ADHD. This is video two of three in my mini series detailing my neurodivergent traits. In my last video, I covered my deficits in social and emotional reciprocity, which was pretty autism heavy. In this video, I'll be going over my sensory sensitivities to things like lights and sounds, as well as my need for sameness and routine, but this time I'll have some of my ADHD traits sprinkled in. So. I'll dive right in, beginning with my sensitivities to sounds. And by sensitivity, I mean listening to eating and slurping noises makes me want to jump across the table and tackle someone. <laughs> Just kidding. I'd never do that. People eating chips out of a bag or cereal out of a bowl are some specific examples. At my last office job, everyone knew that eating cereal bothered me, and a few of the guys came up to my desk and jokingly ate bowls of cereal in front of me. It was all in good fun, and it was one of the few times I felt included in the social banter. But I share this example to show that it was common enough years before my diagnosis that my coworkers knew about it and thought it was strange, and the crinkling of the bag as people put their hands into it to grab a chip and then the subsequent sound of them eating that chip. You're irritating me. I remember getting upset with my daughter when she was a preteen over her eating noises. I experienced such sudden discomfort and rage and I told her that she needed to eat quieter. Understandably, this hurt her feelings and escalated into an argument. My frustration was unfair because she wasn't doing anything bad or wrong, but at the same time, my feelings felt uncontrollable and intense. I didn't understand why something that wasn't harming anyone made me feel so much physical pain and rage. And that's just just it. I can't help the way it makes me feel, but I now recognize that my response is my responsibility. Now if someone is making noises that bother me, I simply remove myself from the situation if I can rather than demand they stop what they're doing. If I can't get away from it for any reason, like if I'm in a public setting, I'll find a way to internally deal with it. I might try to covertly cover one of my ears, leaning my head on my hand, or sometimes I've dug my nails into my skin or clenched my fist to be able to cope with it. That might sound extreme, but some noises really are painful enough that I feel like I have to divert that strong energy somewhere else on my body in a physical way in order to deal with it. I am certainly not suggesting anyone use that as a coping strategy. I'm just telling you what I go through. Cluttered noises where a bunch of different things are happening all at once bother me too. I remember one time, about 10 years ago, we were having a family gathering for Memorial Day. Friends and family, including my three small nieces, were all there. All of the grown-ups were having separate and distinct conversations, and I could hear all of them at the same time. One of my nieces was chattering away at my brother-in-law, despite the fact that he was having his own conversation with someone else, while another one of them was whining nearby. The third one was stomping around the hardwood floor like a T-Rex or something, and there were dishes clanging and clattering. Add into that the separate conversations that various groups of adults were having, and I suddenly had a moment where everything felt like one of the slow motion scenes from The Matrix. I could hear all the sounds and words individually, even though they were all happening at once. My heart started racing and I felt like the outside world was closing in on me. I had a sudden urge to scream and run out of the room and I had no idea why. <laughs> My nieces weren't being bad, they were just being little girls, and the noise level wasn't outrageous or anything, it was relatively normal. It was just the fact that I could hear all the noises distinctly and individually at the same time. I'm also bothered by sudden loud noises or noises that I consider to be inconsiderate like neighbors or other cars playing their music too loud or people talking in a theater. Obviously, anyone is upset by the inconsiderate actions of other people, but it's not the 
person, it's being bothered by the sound itself, like nails on a chalkboard. It makes me feel like an old curmudgeoning person with the propensity to yell at kids to get off my lawn. Before my diagnosis, I thought I had something called misophonia, which is associated with the feeling of rage at trigger sounds. Funny enough, my father had a hatred of sounds too. Did I mention he's the one I got my autism from? Anyway, I found out that there is a genetic marker for misophonia that you could test for on 23andMe. Since my father also had a hatred of sounds, I was certain I would get a positive test result back for this. But when I got the test results back, it was negative for this trait, and I was stumped. I thought for sure I would have the genetic marker since both me and my father had a hatred of sounds. Well, I did inherit my hatred of sounds from my father, but not because of misophonia. It was because I inherited autism from him, and sensitivity to sounds is one of the traits of autism. I later learned that the autistic trait of sound sensitivity is actually called decreased sound tolerance, or DST. According to an article in Neuroscience and Biology, only 3% of people who have autism also have misophonia. DST can be a combination of hypercosis misophonia or phonophobia, but apparently DST and misophonia are not the same thing. See, we've learned something today. So now it makes sense that I was diagnosed with autism and did not show the genetic markers for misophonia. Now let's talk about my sensitivity to bright lights. Bright lights make me feel uncomfortable in my own skin. Picture it like this. You're in a dimly lit nightclub thinking you're this sexy vixen tearing up the dance floor, but then the lights turn on because it's time to go home and you catch a glimpse of yourself in the mirror. <laughs> Suddenly, you realize you actually look more like Gollum from the ring with bloodshot eyes and messed up hair. You suddenly feel exposed and yucky and want to hide yourself so that no one sees you. That's kind of how bright lights make me feel, but it has nothing to do with my appearance. I just didn't really know how else to possibly describe it in a way that people might understand or relate to. Bright lights make me feel naked and exposed and I want to shrink or disappear. It's a sensory nightmare to go to the grocery store next to my house because it is always overcrowded, noisy, and has the fluorescent lighting. And I definitely have to wear sunglasses whenever I'm outside. Now, to be fair, people with lighter colored eyes have less pigment to protect against UV radiation, which makes them more sensitive to sunlight and fluorescent lighting. So, one could make the argument that my blue eyes are the sole cause of my sensitivity, but it's not. My lighter colored eyes causes me to have physical pain in bright sunlight that almost feels like pressure behind my eyes. It's even more painful on a sunny day and there's bright white snow everywhere. However, the autistic sensitivity to light that I experience is a different kind of discomfort that is not always accompanied by that physical pain I just described. My neurotypical husband also has blue eyes, so I asked him about this. He told me he has the same physical discomfort in bright lights like I do, but not the emotional distress that I also experience. Funny enough, my son and I have daily light battles in the house where I go and turn off all the lights everywhere in the house and he follows behind me and turns them all on. As I mentioned in my introductory video, my son is autistic and is how I found out I was also on the spectrum. But light preference for people with autism can vary, and him and I happen to have differences that cause what my husband lovingly refers to as the Battle of the Aspies. <laughs> because he wants all the lights to be on, and I want them all to be off. I also struggle with certain scents like strong perfumes. People with autism have physical and psychological reactions to certain smells. Being trapped in an elevator with someone with strong perfume can affect me for hours after exiting the elevator. It can make me feel anger, annoyance, or have physical reactions like nausea and headaches. My hairdresser knew she had to use non-scented products in my hair because most of the products she tried had scents that really bothered me. And unfortunately, this brings me to another story where my sensory sensitivities caused yet another conflict between my daughter and I. I'm going to owe that girl therapy. There were days where she would put on perfume before school 
I had to drive her to school, which was about half an hour away, which meant I was confined in a small space with it for about an hour, which was pretty distressing. I had asked her not to wear perfume or to wait to put it on when she got to school, but she would forget sometimes. I would then remind her again on the way to school on the days she forgot, which would cause an argument. Now she's mad at me before I drop her off, which is probably getting her off on the wrong foot for the entire day. And again, I don't blame her. To her or anyone else, it seems like I'm just being dramatic or unreasonable about something dumb. It probably seemed like I was just trying to pick a fight with her or being overly critical about a non-issue. I mean, it's just perfume after all. Why am I making such a big deal out of it? Just deal with it. It's not that big of a deal. And the funny thing is, when I was a teenager, I got into fights with my dad over the exact same things. He would get on to me if I wore body sprays, made eating noises, shuffled my feet when I walked, or walked around the house singing too loudly. Now that I have my diagnosis, I think my daughter is able to look back on some of these things with more understanding. Similarly, I'm able to look back on how my own father treated me as a child with more compassion and forgiveness. So to anyone else out there listening to this video who may have had a parent on the spectrum with similar struggles growing up, understanding this fact about them might bring you some healing and peace. Just something to think about. So now I'll describe what my need for sameness and routine look like. I definitely experienced distress with changes. <laughs> There was a time several years ago when we bought all new furniture for our office and bedroom. After it arrived, I should have been happy and excited, but instead, I had immediate feelings of depression and anxiety. At the time, I didn't understand why new furniture was making me feel stressed out when most people would have been happy about having new furniture. It was yet another confusing feeling that just made no sense to me. After several months, I had time to get used to the new furniture and those feelings went away because it was no longer new. <laughs> now that I'm diagnosed, I realize that my reaction was quite simply feeling distressed with change. When my son went into fifth grade, I had to start picking him up in the front of the school instead of the back of the school. And even that small change felt like a challenge to get used to. And don't even get me started on the category level five catastrophe that is called moving into a new house. Now, don't get me wrong, moving is hard for everyone, but the last time I moved, I had such a feeling of not being able to get back into routine that was beyond what most would consider normal in intensity and duration. And it wasn't because it took me six months to get everything unpacked and I didn't know where anything was. Believe it or not, I had almost everything unpacked and put away within like a week. It was because I was now faced with reinventing all new habits and routines in a completely new environment. And by routine, I mean a ridiculous microscopic level of detailed procedures from how I load my dishwasher to the logistics of how I do my laundry. And one might think I'm crazy for throwing the words logistics and laundry together in the same sentence and I wouldn't blame them. But allow me to explain. I have two laundry baskets. One of them goes in my bedroom closet and the other one stays in the laundry room and I just couldn't figure it out. Do I take the bedroom laundry basket from upstairs and bring it downstairs or should I bring the laundry room basket up to my room and take the clothes out of the bedroom laundry basket and bring it downstairs? If I use the bedroom laundry basket to bring my clothes downstairs, should I leave it down there until the laundry is done or should I bring it back upstairs after I put the clothes in the washer? If I leave the bedroom laundry basket basket in the laundry room, it'll be missing if anyone else has dirty clothes to put in it because it wouldn't be there. But if I bring the laundry room basket upstairs, then I have to make an extra trip to bring it back downstairs. You're overthinking this. You think? I got hung up on which kitchen drawer should hold the silverware and which one should hold the spatulas. I overthought the color and style of the hangers in my closet. 
I hemmed and hawed over the uniformity of the types of bags I use in my small trash cans. Should I use plastic grocery store bags or buy small trash bags? It would be more environmentally friendly to use plastic grocery store bags if I grabbed them from the recycling containers at the entrance rather than buying trash bags and adding to plastic waste. But that means I need to get in the habit of using my reusable cloth bags because I don't want to be responsible for taking new plastic bags from grocery stores either. I wonder which car I should start keeping those in then so I won't forget. I could just split them up evenly amongst both cars, but then what if I have a large grocery shopping trip and I don't have all of my reusable bags with me? If you're starting to get exhausted just listening to me, just remember, this is what it's like inside my head 24-7. We're talking about a neurodivergent brain here. What is so simple and insignificant to one person can feel overwhelming to a neurodivergent person. I didn't even realize how bad my inability to cope with moving was until I had an epiphany one day while writing an email. I realized I had referenced my move and work emails for about six months in relation to any delayed replies or mental lackluster. Maybe I thought I was making small talk. I don't know, but for some reason it hit me in one particular email I sent to a colleague that made me realize that other people don't do this. <laughs> other people aren't so bothered by a move that it dominates their functioning, thought processes, and conversations for that long. So yeah, change can be a struggle, but here's where also having ADHD makes things tricky. Because while I experience distress with change, I also have the capability for spontaneity and trying new things. My ADHD side likes vacationing and visiting new places. Heck, I'm spontaneous enough that I could pull the name of a random city out of a hat and book a ticket to go there the very next day. But it wouldn't take long for my autism side to want to go home so I can get back to normalcy and routine. I could also try a crazy new piece of sushi at a sushi restaurant, but there has to be structure and routine in my day to allow for isolated events of spontaneity. An example. I have to start every day out with a venti black coffee from Starbucks with exactly eight to nine large ice cubes to cool it down to something less than lava. It can't be homebrewed coffee, McDonald's, or Dunkin's. Heck, I've even tried Starbucks K-Cups, but it just wasn't the same. It's kind of like that episode of Young Sheldon where he boycotts his favorite bread company because he can tell they changed one of their ingredients. So. I can go on vacation to a new place, but we have to research where Starbucks is nearby, otherwise my whole day will be affected. And I won't be able to try that new piece of sushi if my day didn't start off right, because I'd be out of spoons for the rest of the day. Honestly, I've written and rewritten this part of my script about a hundred times, because it's really hard to describe this concept without seeming like I'm a spoiled brat or getting it confused with the very obvious fact that it's a completely normal thing to want to start your day out with a cup of coffee. But this routine goes deeper than that for me. If I don't start my day off the same way every day, it affects how I feel and occupies real estate in my mind until I go to bed. For most people, if they don't get the particular coffee they want in the morning, Sure, they'll be disappointed, but they likely won't ruminate on it for the next 12 hours. And if I was just being a spoiled brat, I would likely be acting out to get attention, but I internalize and try to mask stuff like this because I know it's not normal. So it's a strange phenomenon of being able to have fun and be spontaneous as long as it's within the confines of my structured routine. Having the dual diagnosis of autism and ADHD can feel like trying to push and pull at the same time. And I think it makes it harder for people to believe me because the conflict between the two can make me appear balanced and normal in many areas. Like a person with just autism might not have the ability to try new foods they've never heard of before. They may have aversions to several foods based on texture, smell, or even color and will avoid them altogether regardless of how hungry they are. Personally, I actually have a pretty varied palate so I don't struggle with food avoidance. 
there's not a lot of foods I won't eat. So because I don't really struggle with the issue of food avoidance, I may not match the stereotypical autistic character many people picture in their mind if I'm willing to eat sea urchin. And a person with just ADHD may not be as obsessively meticulous about routines or organization because most ADHD people self-report having messy, disorganized homes and workspaces. I said most, not all. Don't come at me in the comments section, people. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm so meticulous about organization and routine that it gets in the way of my day-to-day -day life. My husband will laugh at me for slightly moving objects on counters as I walk past them if I don't think they're lined up correctly. And there have been several times I failed to leave the house on time because I'm trying to line up pillows on my couch as I'm trying to get out the door. The traits of having both autism and ADHD can make it look like I have my crap together on the outside, but on the inside, it's like... <laughs> anyway, there's probably a lot more that I could include on this subject, but I'll stop there for now. Hopefully, you'll stick around for my next video where I'll go over the whiteboard of scattered traits and try to make some sense of it all because why not? Bye for now. Mwah. Oh, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Oh, oh, oh.